All right, so our next speaker is David Judson. Um, David is president of Judson Studios. He's the, it's the fifth, gen he's the fifth generation sorry, of the Judson family to leave the studio since it was founded in 1897. He oversees the studio's creative process where he works with architects, designers, and artists who turn to Judson for his legendary work in stained glass. In 2015, he opened the second Judson Studios facility, which incorporates the firm's innovative fusing technology that allows fine artists to express their vision in glass. He's currently working on a book, Judson, Innovation in Stained Glass, which will be published in March of 2020. He's the current president of the Stained Glass Association of America, a member of the Board of Counselors for the Roski School of Art and Design at the University of Southern California, companion of the Guild of St. George, and a board member of the Ruskin Art Club of Los Angeles. Welcome. David. Thank you. Um, and, uh, Thank you for having me. It's, um, it's a great pleasure to be here, and I appreciate Jim putting this together and, and allowing me to speak today, and Gabe. Um, I, uh, I guess I, I'll start a quote with Monty Python. of saying, now we're going to talk about something totally different, right? So there's something completely different. Um, and uh, really want to try to bring you into the 21st century um, with my talk today and draw a line between the 19th century world of Ruskin and, and, and the 21st century uh, life in California. And um, like Ruskin, to a certain extent, I'd, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what I call the German problem, and, and I'll uh, explain that a little bit here. I can say German, but I'm, I'm, my mother's family's German, so I can say that. And, uh, um, but like all good um, stories about stained glass, you have to start here and this is where Ruskin started, at Shark Cathedral. And um, I love this picture. I've, uh, my father had this picture of, uh, and used it in his lectures. And um, when I began to really look at how uh, to draw the link between Ruskin and, and um, stained glass and what we were doing today, uh, I found this letter. Actually, uh, Sarah uh, called this letter to my attention of uh, the, the collection of letters of... Um, Ruskin writing to a friend of his, Edmund Oldfield, who uh, would uh, later become the assistant keeper of antiquities at the British Museum. And Oldfield was a uh, fellow pupil of Ruskin's, and their families were neighbors in Denmark Hill. Um, so he wrote seven letters in 1844, very early, he's 25 years old, um, about stained glass because he and Oldfield were commissioned to... Um, uh, to design a window, and from one of his letters in 1844, May 22nd, Dear Oldfield, I've been all day in the cathedral doing nothing. This is from Sharp. The vivid impression it had left upon me was so far beneath the truth, and the little attention I have lately given to the subject has so far opened my eyes to the value of these windows that I could do nothing for two hours together but walk around and round again, wandering. Ward ought to come here before he is an hour older, for all the cathedrals of Europe could scarcely together furnish such a mass of color as I have been dazzling myself with today. And Ward was the poor guy who had to build the window that Ruskin was designing. As you can imagine, trying to work with Ruskin, because of course he had no opinions. And this is the window that uh, was uh, built in Camberwell. Primarily old, old, Oldfield's design and, and working with Ward, but uh, Ruskin uh, basically drove the, the concept and um, it was kind of interesting to see the result of that. So here's the only repeat quote that I'll provide today. Luckily, when talking about stained glass, there's very little crossover. No one talks about stained glass, so I'm lucky about that. But fine art is that in which the hand the head and the heart of man go together. Jim, Jim mentioned this letter with a longer bit of the quote. Um, and this is, I don't mean to kind of get into the argument of fine art and whether stained glass is fine art, but I do think that uh, it's very important that the person who's making stained glass, is, it's extremely important uh, to know that they are mentally uh, kind of involved and invested in what they're doing. And even today, running a, a stained glass studio, this is still very much a truth. But more of what I want to talk about today is, is material. And uh, we touched on it a little bit yesterday. 
And uh, this quote, I think, is extremely important before we get a little bit further, because I want you to be thinking about material today as I speak, as opposed to design itself. All art working with given materials must propose to itself the objects which, with those materials, are most perfectly attainable, and becomes illegitimate and debased if it proposed to itself any other objects better attainable with other materials. So in other words, pick the right material for what you're doing, right? <laughs> but more than this, he goes on, the workman has not done his duty and is not working on safe principles unless he even so far honors the materials with which he is working as to set himself to bring out their beauty and to recommend and exalt as far as he can their peculiar qualities. If he is working in marble, he should insist upon and exhibit its transparency and solidity. If in iron, its strength and tenacity. If in gold, its ductility, and he will invariably find the material grateful. And that his work is all the nobler for being eulogistic of the substance of which it is made. And to go back to Chart for a minute. But of all the arts, the working of glass is that in which we ought to keep these principles most vigorously in mind. For we owe it so much, and the possession of it is such a great blessing, that all our work in it should be completely and forcibly expressive of the peculiar characters which give it so vast a value. There are two, namely its ductility, or pliability, when heated, and transparency, when cold both nearly perfect. It's the, uh, in its um, uh, employment for vessels, we ought always to exhibit its ductility, and in the employment for windows, its transparency. All work in glass is bad, which does not, with loud voice, proclaim one or the other of these great qualities. And so he goes on to explain a little bit about the uh, ductility, in a, but I want to come back to that, and we'll focus on the windows for a moment. In the case of windows, the points which we have to insist upon are the transparency of the glass and its susceptib uh, sus susceptibility of the most brilliant colors. And therefore, the attempt to turn painted windows into pretty pictures is one of the most gross and ridiculous barbarisms of this preeminently barbarous century. <laughs> <laughs> and so what he's talking about is, is this, what is referred to in... Uh, an appendix of the two paths of Reynolds' disappointment. And this is uh, a window Joshua Reynolds did early. This is, you know, as you see, 18th century. But this was a movement um, of st in stained glass in the uh, beginning in the 18th century, moving into the 19th century that uh, really upholed Ruskin. And so it's not a very good photograph, but even if it was, Ruskin still wouldn't approve of it. It originated, I suppose, with the Germans, who seem for the present distinguished among European nations by the loss of the sense of color. But it appears of late to have considerable chance of establishing itself in England, and is a two-edged error, striking in two directions, first at the beauty, uh, sorry, first at the healthy appreciation of painting, and then at the healthy appreciation of glass. And uh, that's, that's Stones of Venice. And later he says in, in Two Paths, modern attempts to produce furnished pictures on glass result from the same base vulgarism. No man who knows what painting means can endure a painted glass window which emulates painter's work. But he rejoices in a glowing mosaic of broken color, for that is what the glass has, the special gift and right of producing. So basically what he's trying to get at is that painting on a canvas is very different from painting on glass. When you paint on glass, you're working with transmitted light, right? So you're basically, your light source is coming from behind the glass. So anything that you apply, for example, the folds on the garments you see in the medieval window there are basically uh, stopping the light from coming through. And so he's, he's saying, as you see in the, the window on the right, that it's lost all of its translucency. And so it basically kind of robs the material of what it should be doing. Um, I'll continue on, just a, just a couple more quotes here. In the second place, this modern barbarism destroys the true appreciation of the qualities of glass. It denies and endeavors as far as possible to conceal the transparency, 
which is not only its great virtue in a merely utilitarian point of view, but its great spiritual character. This is another important point, the spiritualness he, he refers to in the glass. The character by which in the church architecture it becomes most touchingly impressive as typical of the entrance of the Holy Spirit into the heart of man, a typical expression rendered specific and intense by the purity and brilliancy of its sevenfold hues. And therefore, in endeavoring to turn the window into a picture, we at once lose the sanctity and the power of the noble material and employ it to an end which it is utterly impossible if it should ever worthily attain. So basically, he's giving us four principles to work from. And that's ductility, transparency, color, and this in its spiritual character. The true perfection of a painted window is to be serene, intense, brilliant, the f like flaming jewelry, full of easily legible and quaint subjects, and exquisitely subtle yet simple in its harmonies. In a word, this perfection has been consummated in the designs, never to be surpassed, if ever again to be approached by human art of the French windows of the 12th and 13th centuries. Well, I should probably just end the lecture there, right? And say, <laughs> quit while I'm ahead. But um, he felt very strongly about that, as you can, as you can tell. And um, so uh, he spent a lot of time there. Uh, he spoke about them all the time. He commissioned people to draw them. Um, and then uh, I'll return back to uh, 18, this is 1860. He, uh, I found a letter that he wrote uh, to E.S. Dallas, who's a, a kind of a critic and dealt with psychology and that kind of thing in a lot of his writings. He says, my dear Dallas, the real controversy is not so much between English and foreign glass painting as between the 13th century and modern Germanism. It will rage indistinguishably until people know a little more about drawing and color in general. And so he goes on to say basically how the English are not very good at painting at the time. And the French actually are very brilliant. And he mentions uh, the work that they've done at Saint-Chapelle and, and he can't distinguish the ancient glass from the contemporary glass. So even if you go, unfortunately, I hate to break the news to you, but if you go to Saint-Chapelle, it's very beautiful, but you're looking at 19th century glass. Um, and then he goes on, the Germans likewise excel us far in, the inst in all instances that I have seen in this school of elaborate figure painting on glass. The whole school is false and ridiculous, but our fallacies are the foolishest. He's speaking about the English. It will be some time, of course, before the school of mud, he calls it the school of mud, in general, Winterhalter and modern German Sentiment de Glace is got rid of. And so um, this is a much later window, but, but really the resurgence in the 19th century of stained glass starts in Germany and then very quickly uh, uh, in England, but this, this you know, uh, speaking about stained glass in Europe is a very touchy subject, right, because of very nationalistic associations with the medium and the material. Um, you know, some people say, oh, are you going to go fix the glass in Notre Dame? It's like, they're not going to let an American touch that glass, so don't, don't worry. <laughs> um, but of course, you know, a year later, two, two years later, Morris and Company, starts and opens. And this is um, actually a window that's here at the Huntington. You can go and see it if you haven't seen it. It's worth visiting. And um, so in essence, uh, I think Morris Company kind of resolves the whole issue that um, Ruskin has. And, and Ruskin obviously remains friends with uh, Burne Jones his whole life between tiffs. <laughs> but there's one main difference and um, it's, it's an interesting one because it's, and it has nothing to do with painting or the pre-Raphaelites and painting at all. It's in glass. The main difference between these two windows is the one on the right has perspective, right? And so it's looking at a scene and on the left, uh, you see the figures, but there's kind of representations of nature that basically create the backdrop. So this is a major kind of parting and, and part of this uh, concept of the, of the Germanness of glass that I'll get into a little bit. Meanwhile, on this side of the Atlantic, there's uh, the American art glass movement that starts in the late 19th, early 20th century. Again, this is in, uh, uh, here in Pasadena, a window here in Pasadena. And um, 
there is basically two um, kind of fields in the United States as well. Tiffany did the American art glass window along with Lafarge and some others of, of, of the opalescent glass. So basically that glass was not transparent. And so it was basically rejected by the Anglophiles and, and uh, the folks who believed in kind of this um, purity of glass. And Connick represents that. So Connick came out of uh, Manchester and was uh, basically one of the most important art glass makers in the United States. Um, so now that I've gotten you over the, the Atlantic, I have to bring you to the West Coast. I do that with my Gregor grandfather. And so if there's an illustration of a Ruskinian, I think this is it. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, I'm, I'm not really, I didn't pick Ruskin. I kind of, uh, being the great or grandson of, of William Lees Judson, I'm, I really have lived in the shadow of a Ruskinian kind of philosophy uh, that was, I, I inherited. I didn't, I didn't uh, go to it. And um, I think Gabe kind of set the stage for kind of uh, the, the um, example of uh, how, uh, some of that heritage got here on the West Coast. And it's interesting because Judson came from Ashton under Lyne, which is just outside of Manchester. And so that was a community that basically got swept up in the Industrial Revolution. Jim, Jim sent, uh, showed some pretty um, amazing photographs yesterday. Um, but basically, you know, from 1800 to... Uh, there is basically 3,000 handlooms, like you see here, and uh, at the end of the 18th century, uh, there's just 300 of them, right? They've moved to kind of an industrial scenario. In 1843, which is the year after where William Lee Judson is born, there's 67 power looms, right? They're all powered by coal. And so um, I think Jim's photographs were much better about him um, showing that. So basically, uh, William Lee Judson's father, uh, who was an artist and, and a designer, uh, but worked in the mills to kind of make ends meet, um, decided that he'd had enough, and he left. And so he came to uh, the United States, settled in Brooklyn and farmed, if you can imagine farming in Brooklyn. Um, and then they went to Canada and, because they were giving land basically to, as, as part of the Commonwealth to, to whoever would work the land. And so his, his father took him up to Canada. And then um, this is in 1854 when, when Judson comes over. And then... Uh, Judson, who, uh, my great-grandfather, who, who kind of had itchy feet, was always moving around and uh, found himself in Illinois in 1864 uh, and signed up um, in the 21st uh, Regiment of Illinois. And this is actually Grant's regiment. And so he actually marches with Grant down to Tennessee when, when Grant um, later gets called to D.C. And this medal was presented to him um, by the... Um, uh, widow of Ulysses S. Grant when they dedicated the tomb in Chicago. He was the last surviving member of his regiment. He goes back to Canada and really starts his art career in earnest. And he was a painter, painting the kind of the landscapes primarily, did a lot of portraits. He was a teacher as well. One of his students was Paul Peel, who's still arguably one of the most famous artists in Canada. He went to France and studied at the uh, Julian Academy. And this was the professor of his professor, who's Lefebvre and, and uh, um, Boulanger, and also um, uh, studied in the, in the Louvre, did a lot of painting in the evenings. Um, in his letters, his wife writes him and says, look, you have to come home. They had six children, and he was kind of gallivanting around, and so it's says, it's time for you to come home. And uh, she, he came home, and uh, after the birth of their last child, she passed away, and so he was left with six children to take care of six children. And so he, he taught and remained in Canada for a number of years and then moved to Chicago in 1890 when the kids had gotten a little bit older. His first office was in this building, the um, auditorium building. Couldn't afford to be there. But this is a Louis Sullivan uh, building, and Frank Lloyd Wright would have been working there at the time. So I always imagine them passing each other in the elevator as they go to the top floor. He was involved with the... Um, art building that was um, built in Chicago, but basically was told to go west. He, he had uh, kind of, his, his health was failing him, and so um, he met a, a friend who told him that the place to be was Pasadena, California, and so he came to Pasadena, and uh, 
he wrote a letter on December 13th. This is December, so I know some of you are coming from some colder climates. So coming here in December in 1893, he writes his daughter, My dear Bertha, this is the beginning of the realization of the dream of my life. If you were all here in a house of my own with a modest income, I think I should be entirely happy. I have found a country where I could settle down without any desire or expectation to move again. And so I think this is a great example of you know, really the philosophy that Gabe was speaking about earlier. And really what attracted the artists were the Arroyo Seco, and these are all paintings of the Arroyo. He found a house right on the uh, left side. That's his house, the large one on the left. And um, their LA Times, early LA Times article talks about that turret and that kind of turret having a cot and an easel. <laughs> That's how, so he could paint and capture the light. These are some sketches of his traveling around. He went to the Sierras, the mountains, the beaches, everywhere. He traveled all around the Southwest, uh, painting and sketching. And these are just some of his quick sketches. So he became known as the professor. He was really the only one who, uh, coming in 1893, the only one who really had uh, university-level teaching um, skills at the time. And this was uh, a, a photograph from the University of Southern California's El Rodeo in 1899, before they even had this building. So he um, built the building in 1900 and founded the School of Fine Arts here, and right in the center of what was the arts and crafts movement in Southern California. He painted a lot of the, uh, the missions. There was a strong movement of restoring the missions, and he um, documented a lot of those. And traveled around with, all, with this, this man, George Wharton James, who was a friend of his, who really um, was a Methodist minister and had many, uh, I guess, nieces. This is a, supposedly a niece, right, that he traveled around with. <laughs> Judson on the right. <clears throat> and this is uh, them on the Colorado River. When it, when it flooded and created the Salton Sea, they ran out and, and um, started documenting it. And George Wharton James said that Judson was the worst traveling companion because as soon as they pulled up ship, he got out and started painting and didn't set up camp, you know, and they had to, he got stuck. <laughs> the two of them became very, you know, very strong friends, and they started what was called the Royal Guild. And again, this is a, a, a product of, of um, what Gay was sitting, talking about earlier. And a very, it's a very nostalgic, idealistic movement that um, references um, a lot of this kind of very um, idealistic State and, and they were basically trying to do kind of what, what Stickley was doing and, and Hubbard were doing on the East Coast and um, trying to uh, basically also it was a business adventure, right? They were trying to sell their wares. And notice this is the Royal Guild of Fellow Crafters and not craftsmen, so there was a lot of um, women involved as well. Um, they published the Royal Craftsman. And the Royal Craftsman was to be the West Coast answer to um, Stickley's The Craftsman. Um, but they were better craftsmen than publishers. They didn't get past this volume, one, volume one, number one. <laughs> um, but there's an article inside that just, just to kind of give you an idea that uh, entitled The Dawn of the New Era. It says, but the dawn of the new era is here. The glimmerings have been seen for long. Plato and all the idealists saw them and such men as Wadsworth, Woodsworth, Wadsworth, Ruskin, Browning have been calling our attention to them with increasing force and insistency. And later it says, uh, many a great man has said, this is uh, about Ruskin, many a great man has said that Ruskin formed an epic in his life. Why? Solely because he took the hand of the earth looker, he who lived for and by sense and helped him up the delectable mountains and then showed him visions of the land and of the spirit. Um, the center, the school was also the headquarters of the Royal Guild, and, and they met a lot there. There was a, this is a, a longer story, but Thaddeus Lowe, who uh, was um, kind of industrialist that came to Southern California, built a plant down in the Arroyo, and uh, supposedly the fumes came up and, and came through the building, and so Judson told him he should shut down, shut down, um, he never really does, so Judson sued him and won, and he had to shut the plant down, so he was an early environmentalist. Later that year, the studio burnt down. I'm not promoting any conspiracies, but <laughs> it was rebuilt, and uh, more of an arts, arts and crafts kind of a th aesthetic to it. 
and the, and the guild remained, uh, this is 1910, um, somewhat intact. And the school, as you can see, grew. And uh, as you can see, it's mostly, mostly women. And it attracted people from all over. Um, one of the most interesting figures is this, this guy right here. His name's Antonio Corsi. And he was a model, a very famous model, that actually modeled for Burne Jones and modeled for Singer Sargent before making his way out to California. And William Lees was, was instrumental in bringing him back. So through all of that, the thread that kind of remained was um, stained glass. And so Judson, these are the sons of William Lees Judson, the guy with the great mustache in the middle. That's my grandfather. And uh, they started the Judson Studios in 1897, started in downtown Los Angeles. And then when, this, when the school moved out of the building that I just showed you, the, the, the studio moved in there. One of their neighbors was um, Clyde Brown, who built the Abbey San Encino. And uh, they built this window for him, which is, um, was uh, bartered for printing materials. Clyde Brown was a printer. And this window is about as politically correct as Ruskin was, right? <laughs> um, but uh, uh, they kind of flourished. Um, Gabe mentioned um, Julia Brecken went, who uh, built, uh, designed the three muses that you see at the bottom there, and uh, Judson did the globe and the dome at the top. This was now the Natural History Museum, but then was the, the building of the fine arts. It was built in 1914. And the influence of the arts and crafts kind of you know, reached, obviously, uh, the West Coast and was very strong. Um, but in, in the 20s, that, well, that window was being made by Judson here on the West Coast. We'll go back to Germany for a minute and look at the Bauhaus. So um, this kind of changed the idea of glass quite a bit. Um, glass was an important aspect of what the Bauhaus was doing, um, and they were pushing the envelope. Now, that's not to say that on the, in the United States we weren't doing something similar. Um, this is the Hollyhock House, which Judson did the windows for Frank Lloyd Wright here in Los Angeles, as well as the Ennis House. Um, but this right was the exception, right? That the, the aspect of traditional glass uh, was uh, still very strong and prominent in, in the United States. And after the war, so you have the Depression and then you have World War II, and then when Germany starts to rebuild, this is what they go to, right? And uh, whereas in the United States, same year, this is, this is kind of the, the piece of reading. And this is not everybody, I'm generalizing because I have to get through a lot of material here, but... Uh, being on the West Coast, there's something uh, nostalgic about being on the West Coast. A lot of traditional work still being done in California, kind of this yearning for the past. And a lot of, you think about all the mil military guys that were coming home from Europe, having seen uh, probably a lot of cathedrals and such. And that's not to say, again, not, uh, not everything. In 1960, this is the Air Force Academy Chapel that uh, actually my grandfather did. And um, we're actually going to be restoring this next year. So um, not all of our military budget is for <laughs> nefarious purposes. So, and somehow this uh, snuck through. We were very nervous about all of the military funding and how far south it was going. But anyway, um, to skip to uh, kind of more modern day, because I really what I want to do is bring you into the 21st century. And uh, this is a, a piece... Um, done by an American artist, but fabricated in a German studio. And, and as today, you know, being the fifth generation of a studio, uh, there's only so much you can do in the past to compete with what's going on. And the Germans got very good, as you see, starting with the Bauhaus post-war. Their contemporary techniques were, were very strong while we were doing this at the same time, right? And this is 2012. And this is a beautiful window. I, mean, I, I had to train my artists to really work in this uh, medium. And, and the fact that they um, were able to pick this up, because a lot of times when I started in the mid-90s, the figurative drawing was, was not necessarily uh, prominent in the art schools at the time, right? But um, it was, I was uh, when I really started looking, and I, I opened up an art gallery and started doing gallery shows, 
to attract artists in the art community in the area. And what I found, there was a very strong figurative glass movement right here at the Art Center in Pasadena. And so I was able to actually, uh, this, this was done by Tim Carey, who was actually a graduate of, of Art Center. And um, so that uh, resource was much closer than I thought it would be. That led to this project, which is, um, again, talking about nostalgia. <laughs> a project that, that was built at the, um, the Catholic Center at USC. And uh, this project, ironically, is the project that brought us into the computer age. So if you think about when you're designing a stained glass window, you're, you're, you're designing on an inch to foot scale with a beautiful watercolor, and then you have to by hand create a full size cartoon, right, to go into that. And all of those things, while, while beautiful and by hand, just get stuffed into the archives, right? So we had to figure out a way, especially if we were gonna scale up and do larger scale projects and keep them somewhat at a price that people would be willing to pay, so we had to submit to the computer. And being a studio full of Luddites, that was not easily uh, convertible with our artists, but they relented. And um, so we were able to actually, these figures that you see here, we actually, these are like posed and photographed with a digital camera, laid in with the camera and drawn on top of to create. And um, so it, it kind of gave us a, a really powerful uh, ability to shift some of our time and effort to, um, to the actual finished product. So that brings us back here. So uh, a project came up a couple of years ago where uh, a church was being built in Kansas City. It was a very major project. I'll show you in a second. And uh, they searched all over the world, actually. There was two dozen studios, and it came down to these two, right? The, a very traditional designer with a very contemporary one. So we knew that something was amiss in the, in the building, but this is the building, and they surveyed their um, congregation, and they said, well, what would make our space feel sacred? And the overwhelming answer, luckily for us, was stained glass. And so not having anywhere to put glass, the architect put a massive stained glass window in the front. Uh, whether Ruskin would approve is beyond the point, right? We're not going to talk about that. But we created a design, um, basically, that would try to marry con contemporary and, and um, uh, traditional work. And so we, we created this window, which got us the job and eventually turned into this. And we had to cut off the pastor and say, no more figures. We're not going to add any more figures. <laughs> but that's the, the, the double-edged sword of the computer, is to, is to do that, right? But here's the facility um, that we had to tackle. And so, but basically we designed something we didn't know how to make. So we said, well, how are we going to make this? And uh, we, were, we looked around and we found this man, Narcissus Quagliata. And he built these amazing windows. And it probably seems counterintuitive. That how, how is that person going to help us make this? But when we start looking at his work, we realized uh, that he had done a lot of magic to create things. And he was combining it with glass painting. And so if we could tie glass painting in with what we were trying to do, um, then we could really make something happen. And so this is where the ductibility comes in, where I want to quote Ruskin real quickly. All very neat, finished, and perfect form in glass is barbarous, for this fails in proclaiming another of its great virtues, namely the ease with which its light substance can be molded or blown into any form, so long as the perfect accuracy be not required in metal uh, sorry, <clears throat> in metal, which even when heated enough to be thoroughly malleable, retains yet such weight and consistency as render it susceptible of the firmest handling and retention of the most delicate form. Great precision of workmanship is admissible, but in glass, which when once softened must be blown or molded, not hammered, and which is liable or loose by contraction or subs uh, subsidence, the finest of the forms given to it, no delicate outlines are to be attempted, but only such fantastic and fickle grace as the mind of the workman can conceive and execute on the instant. The more wild, extravagant, and grotesque in their gracefulness of the forms are, the better. No material is so adapted for giving full play to the imagination, but it must not be wrought with refinement or painfulness." And so basically what he's talking about is glass blowing and working with glass while it's hot, right? And that's what's happening here. As you're seeing now, 
wow, if we can manipulate the material to not only just paint on the surface of a sheet of glass, but actually melt and fuse the glass together. And so we created a, a, a panel and realized, wow, we can really change things. So look at how, uh, how much color you can introduce into that. Um, and I'll just wrap you through quickly, but to do that, to, to heat glass, you can't be in a 100-year-old building that has a, a single-phase 200-amp electrical box. <laughs> so we had to um, move to another facility, which was actually very interesting, 1,897 uh, feet away from our current facility. So it was meant to be. It was the year the company was founded. So by taking granulated glass, we could throw it out and put it in the kilns and play with it and create the effects like this. This is one of the effects that we had. Um, and so you, by putting it in the kiln as, in a granulated form, we could basically create brush strokes of glass and assemble it. So as the pieces were, were fused together, we began assembling them. Sorry, I'm going to fly through these because I'm already getting pulled off the stage. But look at this, how, how beautiful it is. It's, it's amazing what we could do with the material. Flowers. Here you see the scale of the, pro of the window. And of course, it's Kansas City, so there has to be sunflowers. But really, the most important piece is this one, which I think is... Uh, pretty amazing. This is the most amazing piece of glass I've ever, personally, I've ever seen. Um, but, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we move forward with this, and how do we um, kind of justify the fact that we're working in something that's completely never, never really been done before, and I didn't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing that no one had ever done this before. So I went back and I looked, and there had been several attempts throughout history. Um, Lafarge tried it, and he, uh, the figure, uh, there's one other window that he did. Of course, the Bauhaus, working in different materials and experimenting with the actual glass, not, not the, um, just the painting itself. In France, there is a, uh, what was called the um, uh, Dorschmann, uh, Dorschmann uh, fused all of this glass together, but it was very um, uh, archaic because he couldn't get it to fuse together because the technology wasn't there. And even uh, Connick, who worked during the war when he didn't have lead or materials, he basically was experimenting. And of course, Picasso worked with it and uh, claimed that it was, you know, a new art is born and we're being able to work with glass. And again, this is a technique that had to require adhesives. You, they couldn't fuse this glass together because the technology didn't exist. And even in the 80s, uh, people trying it, knowing that it was going to break, but they did it anyway. And Rufino Tamayo, also very famous. So it's not until 1981 that bullseye glass creates the first compatible glass that it can actually be fused together. And um, so this, this is a major breakthrough because uh, now glass didn't have to be just a sheet of glass. You could actually fuse them together. And I don't know if anybody recognizes the guy on the left. Before the eye patch. Yeah, it's Dale Chihuly. And so... Uh, this we credit with heart to Harvey Littleton, who really started what's called the studio glass movement. And he basically did a very Ruskinian thing, and he democratized the, the ability to blow glass. So before this time, you had to have major equipment. And uh, it was Harvey Littleton who really uh, trained all of these people out of Wisconsin to work with glass. And this is some of his early work. So if you imagine to Chihuly, right, you see where he came out of. Now, of course, Chihuly went west, and this is the last theme of my story of going west, starting Pilchuck, um, where uh, the hot glass movement went. Also out of the Littleton studio glass movement in Portland is the warm glass movement. So warm glass is working with kilns as opposed to blowing glass. And this is the ductibility uh, issue that I'm talking about that, that Ruskin addressed. And this is the first, Narcissus piece, first kind of two-dimensional fused glass major structural piece that was built, and this is 1995, so this is fairly new technology. So our question is, what do we do with it, right? So how do we keep moving forward? So we started reaching out to artists, and you know, this is a watercolorist. We were able to kind of tap into um, 
a, a flexibility that allowed us a whole other um, kind of technology that we could, we could uh, build on. And we went out to artists. Street artists were the first ones to really respond to this. A street, a street painter and showed in the gallery in Santa Barbara. We went to galleries, artists and galleries. So pieces like this that could be drawn up when fused totally took on a new life. There you see the finished piece. We have applications for public art. You see here beautiful examples of being able to hear it. We went to abstract artists. We've been working with abstract artists. This is Sarah Kane, who got a, a project up in um, the San Francisco airport. This is now installed in the San Francisco airport. You can go and see it. And painters and, uh, who'd never worked in glass before, this is really what we were trying to kind of break, break through kind of traditional limitations of what, what could be done. I convinced this artist, James Dean, to do a three-dimensional piece, which is a horrible idea because it was extremely difficult to make. And this is what it looks like when it's spread out. But the idea being that, really, uh, if you think about all of the artists in the past that worked in glass, if they'd had this other ability, and this is, again, a, a, a principle that I believe that we can still attribute to Ruskin in a way and tie it in to what is being done today. But you think about all of these artists and what they could do if they were able to uh, you manipulate the glass, not only just paint on the glass, but actually manipulate it um, to create a more painterly-like effect. One, one artist that I was not able to convince <laughs> was Hockney, if you guys know that Hockney did the Queen's Window at Westminster. But I knew you know, the person who made this window for him, Helen Whitaker, out of York, and she is coming next month to work in fusing, and so we're, we're a step closer, I think. But I think what's important is that you have these artists that are still doing uh, something that is years and years uh, in the making that uh, if we had listened to Ruskin, maybe would have stopped. <laughs> but um, something about the spirit of the West Coast, too, I think has something to say about you know, this, this being a window that is a beautiful window, but really, I think, somewhat constrained in, in these preconceived notions of what stained glass is and what it does. I think Hockney, uh, you know, first time working in glass, did what he could do, having designed it on an iPad. But if you take for a second what can be done you know, here in Grace Cathedral, and what the options are. I think there's a bright future for stained glass. And that's it. Thank you very much.